we're going to get started. We're going to get started now since um, we have a really wonderful presentation today. I just wanted to provide some context for our discussion that grounds this work um, before we get started. So for decades, we've been hearing about the long term negative impacts of early exposure to adverse experiences. For those of us who've worked directly with clients who've experienced unimaginable losses and adversity, we have some sense of how hard it is to help build resilience, confidence, and hope. So for example, how a parenting teen who has experienced recent loss due to co the COVID-19 crisis and housing instability can still rise to the tremendous challenge of parenting. It takes systematic, strength-based approaches that engage organizations on different levels, as well as communities and systems. So for the excellent work and resources that we'll talk about today from Tennessee, we wanted to answer the important questions. How can we build resilience and protective factors in families and children, families and communities? And what is needed on a systems level or a state level to do so? So this is so important for our systems of care work and especially for the capacity building work that we do with infants, toddlers and young children. I'm really excited for you folks to be able to engage with our wonderful speaker today, who I'm going to introduce. Um, and personally, especially because um, I'm Pamela Trevetti, I'm the infant and early childhood um, transformation team lead for our center. And I come to the world of training and technical assistance with a clinical lens. I was a school psychologist and later an infant mental health consultant serving children and families experiencing homelessness here in DC. I know program administrators, policymakers, and practitioners will share my enthusiasm for trauma-informed approaches and what we're going to hear about today um, because of the tremendous potential to build resilience in um, children and families from even the most vulnerable circumstances. So we also, we also think this work is particularly important, and I know this has been on all of our minds as we consider how to support young children, families, and communities in recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. We know that you've all been really conscientious about thinking through how the pandemic relates and intersects, it intersects with the experiences of racial trauma, um, it's something that would all been on all of our minds. So I think that when you hear about this work and some of the, the excellent sort of capacity building approaches to workforce development that our colleague is going to talk about, you know, all of that is going to be sort of something that we can consider because um, it's very of the moment as well. So I'm, I'm excited that our conversation will touch on all of this. This is a lot of anticipation for introducing our wonderful speaker. Just when you when you folks get a chance, if you could chat in your name and role and where you're coming from, that would be awesome. Um, so this is a, just a disclaimer here that our center, which I'm going to say a few words about, is um, funded by SAMHSA, but uh, the views expressed here today um, are not from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or HHS. Let me advance slides here. Um, and also, sorry, we've had a couple of issues in our um, learning opportunities that we've been offering. And if there's an issue, we'll end the session with Zoom bombing, unfortunately. If there's an issue, we'll end the session and you'll get further information about how to get the content by email. I don't think we'll have a problem today because we have put in a lot of uh, some good security in place, but just in case. Um, Right, a few words about our center. We're the um, National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Children, Youth, and Family Mental Health. We have a multi multidisciplinary team of some great partners, and those of you who've come to some of our other events may have heard a little bit about our wonderful partners. Um, we provide innovative, it's our goal to provide innovative, responsive, and multimodal trainings and technical assistance that support systems level change and advancement of evidence-based and culturally responsive practice that is also trauma-informed, which is bringing us right to our presentation today. Here are some of the cross-sector audiences that we serve, um, and here is a very nice graphic that um, some excellent folks put together for us that sort of let us know about um, some of our approaches and um, services that we offer through our center. If you're not on the mailing list less yet, I hope you um, can subscribe so you could get some of our resources that we regularly send out. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to um, introduce our speaker for today. My very good friend, Jennifer Drake Croft, is the Director of Child um, Wellbeing with the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. 
Um, I always, I mean, I always learn so much every time I speak to, to Jen. She is a dynamic state leader and I'm so proud of all that she's done. Um, Jen sits on multiple state and local committees and has helped lead and shape macro level initiatives and policies to promote healthy child development, prevent adverse childhood experiences and support resilient communities. Um, Jen was a founding member of All Children Excel in Nashville, which is a kind of a collective with hundreds of members that um, seeks to reduce ACEs and promote resilience at the population level using a public health approach. So Jen has, Jen has developed some really amazing resources for the Tennessee workforce, a train the trainers curriculum that's focused on brain development, ACEs and strategies to foster resilience in this initiative called the Building Strong Brains Initiative. It's, it's, you, you folks are gonna be really excited to see how sort of work came together across sectors and with the support from the executive branch in Tennessee to make this all happen. Um, I don't, I don't want to kind of anticipate too much Jen's presentation, but just a, a couple more personal accomplishments, professional accomplishments that I'm really proud of Jen for. Um, Jen was a member of the Nashville Emer Emerging Leaders class in 2017 and received an award, um, an Emerging Leaders Award for government in government and public affairs and was named one of the University of Tennessee's inaugural 40 under 40 um, recipients in 2021. And um, I, I know Jen personally and her, um, I'm just always really impressed by her passion to support um, resilience um, and just sort of how broadly she thinks of things, but kind of how she has the empathy to think about the situation of kids and families and kind of that being able to hold both both of those pieces in mind at all times is is really so impressive and helpful. Um, so without further ado, I want to turn it over to Jen before she gets embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so let me go ahead and find my presentation and we'll get started. All right. And bear with me as I get it. Uh, okay. Pamela, we all good to go? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So I just want to start by saying thank you for attending this today. And um, I hope you'll be able to tell that this is my personal and professional passion. Um, I also want to let you know that you all will receive a PDF version of the slides. There will be some slides in there for your reference that are not included in this presentation. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that I will be going through a lot of these slides quickly. And that's another reason and I have that for your reference um, so that you can dig a little deeper and just know that I'm available for questions afterward. So feel free to reach out. So without further ado, as, as Pamela said, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so quick overview of our mission with Building Strong Brains Tennessee. Our work is to change the culture of Tennessee so that the state's overarching philosophy, policies, programs, and practices for children, youth, and young adults use the latest brain science to prevent and mitigate the impact of adverse childhood experiences. So I'm going to be operating from a framework today that was created by um, just a wonderful um, leader in leadership. His name is, is Simon Sinek. He's written several um, best-selling leadership books, but one that really changed my perspective on how I do business is um, the book Start With Why. So we're organized by this framework of golden circles today, which is something that um, he came up with, which is arguing that we always need to be starting with why, but often in society, we are leading with how or what. And that is um, an ineffective way to get people to buy in uh, to the work that you're doing and to generate the sort of movement at scale that needs to happen in order for us to, to get the political and um, you know grassroots will that it takes in order to, to be able to really meet families and young children and, and infants where they are and to provide them the services and supports and you know, wrap those around in a way that really is going to improve their lifelong trajectory. So very quickly, what, you know, we know what we do, 
how we do it. We often know how we do it, but a lot of organizations don't know why they do what they do. And so really distilling why we're doing what we're doing is an important part. I will tell you all, being in this field, we have a clearer sense of why than a lot of like the for-profit sectors, um, but we often don't communicate that to different stakeholders in our community. So hopefully um, you all know about your limbic brain and you know the fact that it is our primary motivator uh, for change. It, it in, in, um, uh, gets at our emotional responses and motivation and all those things. And so when we are tapping into our why, and in particular, connecting with other people's why, we're tapping into the most powerful structure for behavior change and changing your lens on how you see the world. And we'll do a better job of getting more folks to rally around your cause. So in Tennessee, um, I will tell you all that this, the secret sauce and by no means, I don't want you all to think that we've got everything figured out in Tennessee. I'm going to be highlighting what works today, but certainly there are barriers and challenges, and I just don't want to overstate the successes. Um, so know that those exist, and if you are curious about what those look like, please feel free to reach out to me directly. But the secret sauce for some of our successes has absolutely been our communication style and starting with why. So um, many of you may be familiar familiar with the Frameworks Institute. It is an organization that translates lots of complex social issues to metaphors, tested metaphors and values that can be understood by the public and that work in advancing policy change and practice change. So the values that we employed with um, with this work with Building Strong Brains Tennessee were three that were tested with early childhood, well, two that were tested with early childhood development and child maltreatment. And those include prosperity and collective ingenuity. We have borrowed one from education with their permission, of course, um, which is fairness across places. And I'm sorry, this the slides have gotten a bit wonky here. Um, but with fairness across places, that is really the value that we employ to advance the equity lens in this work, because we know that we're not going to improve outcomes for all children in Tennessee if we don't have an eye toward um, those inequities and disproportionate representation in a lot of things that are stressful and adverse for kids. Um, so with that, with prosperity, I'm just going to fly through these and say that, you know, from the get-go, we are telling people why this matters to them, right? Um, so we're saying that healthy child development is the foundation for educational achievement, economic productivity, responsible citizenship, and lifelong health. This leads to, to successful parenting of the next generation, which ultimately leads to strong communities and a healthy economy. So our message is this. Even if you don't like infants and toddlers, even if you don't like children in general, it is going to benefit you to have an eye toward ensuring that all of our children develop in a, in a healthy manner because it's going to impact your local economy and your businesses. It's going to impact um, the way your tax dollars are spent. And at the most basic level, it's going to impact um, your quality of life and the safety of yourself and your family. So we all have something to gain when we invest in early childhood development. Um, so another thing that this slide and, and future slides bring up really is that that value and concept of prosperity, which we see, I know that that can feel a little icky to folks like us that are in it for the human reasons, but we all know that most most people don't think about most social issues most of the time. Um, and so we have to really get at what is going to be the driver. And so what works for me and what works for you is not necessarily what works for the majority of other sectors or else they'd be doing what we are doing, right? So moving on, um, you know, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences in that study, is one framework that we operate um, out of here in Tennessee, um, but we blend in a lot of other stuff. And so ACEs is often the, the, the hook, I guess you could say, where people, their ears perk up. And when we're making this connection specifically between early childhood adversity and these later health issues, you know, nine out of 10 of our leading diseases, that tends 
tends to get people's attention. Um, but I want to let you know that we'll be diving into some of the other elements that we weave into this because we don't view adverse childhood experiences or as just those 10 um, questions studied in the original ACE questionnaire. We really include the expanded ACE, um, ACE questions as well as a lot of the social determinants of health in the way that we conceptualize and react to this work. But getting back to values and getting back to prosperity, we show this slide often that was developed by Dr. Onda, where we say, hey, look at these 10 outcomes from adverse childhood experiences and look at the prevalence of those respective issues that are attributable to an adverse childhood experiences exper uh, experience score of four or more. And there are 30 more right outcomes that look just like this, that if we were to think about addressing early childhood adversity as putting a paper towel in the middle of this oil spill and soaking it up, we would see a simultaneous and relative reduction in these 10 areas, as well as those 30 other negative outcomes that have been attributed to adverse childhood experiences. And so I say that to say that it really does click with folks that this is the smarter, more effective way to move from marginal results on seemingly intractable issues to more massive results is getting to the root cause. Of course, it, we're not going to solve all of cardiovascular disease, but what this slide shows us is that we could reduce it by 25% while we're also reducing all these other problems. In Tennessee, we also know that conservatively, ACEs cost our state $5.2 billion per year. So this, again, is a way that we queue up that value and help lawmakers and community members understand why this issue matters to them. And then lastly, most of you have seen this graphic, the Heckman equation graphic, where we talk about the return on investment that has been found in early childhood programs, but we emphasize that there's still a return on investment later on in life. And if we want to think about how to do this most effectively, we need to think about a two-gen approach where we are not only seeing the return on investment here in the earliest years of life, but also with the caregiver later on. So now that you know our why and how we're communicating our why, um, I'm going to talk about the how. And a lot of times we weave in the um, other uh, two values into the how statement. So if you'll remember from the previous slide, they are collective ingenuity and they are fairness ac across places, which is essentially saying that all kids deserve an equal shot no matter where they live, right? Um, and so the reason that these two work so well, particularly the collective ingenuity, is that a lot of times the general public has been hearing about our issues for so long that they just become tuned out to it and think that this is just the way it's gotta be. Like the poor will always be with us and child abuse and neglect will always be with us. And so these values really take people from that stuck position and help them think about how they fit into a collective strategy to advance um, and make traction on these issues because it doesn't have to be this way and the science shows us that. So after we've communicated our why, we're gonna get into the how. And we're going to get more into this evidence-based communication that is it was developed by the Frameworks Institute. Um, if you all have not heard of the Frameworks Institute, you probably are using their metaphors all the time and don't know it. I know that I was before I was introduced to them, but they uh, came up with the terms toxic stress and serve and return interactions, right? Um, as well as the resilient scale metaphor and air traffic control for executive functioning. So while we use many other metaphors in our work, these four blue circles that you see that represent those four primary metaphors, that's what we often lead with to help the public better understand through effective metaphors uh, what it is that we're talking about, how it works, and why it matters. Um, so they, you know, when you go on Harvard Center for the Developing Child's website, you'll see all of these used all over the place, and that's because they were funded by Harvard um, to develop this and have worked closely with Harvard ever since. Um, so I'm so glad that it has become a part of our vernacular and our academic literature in a way that we just have normalized it. Um, but many people don't understand the power behind using these. 
Another how that we that we use to our advantage is just explaining how early adversity, not just ACEs, but early adversity generally can stack up and lead to a toxic stress response, leading to all of these issues. So we're explaining again that how it works approach where we're filling in a lot of the question marks between A and Z when we're saying adversities um, and, and toxic stress lead to these negative outcomes in adulthood. We also have taken a real public health approach because we know that adverse childhood experiences, child maltreatment, all the things we care about, no matter how you word it, it is a public health issue and arguably one of the most important public health issues we're ever gonna face. And so we tend to focus primarily on tertiary and secondary prevention. Um, and yet we're still um, not at scale with those things. We know we need more uh, treatment and more services for those who are at risk. But a big reason we don't have that is because we haven't done a lot of the primary prevention work. So we need to be doing these at all three of these at the same time. So with Building Strong Brains, our goal has been to have everybody in the state, we're not there yet, but everybody in the state understand what ACEs are, what toxic stress are, is, and, um, and then that, 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 that will empower them to understand the issues that they see in our state in a different manner, right? In a more trauma-informed manner. We liken a lot of this to changing the culture of smoking, where you can go on the street, go into to a Target parking lot and ask people, what are three diseases associated with smoking? And they can tell you, right? Nobody who's smoking is surprised when you tell them that they could get cancer. Um, and so similarly, we need this same thing to happen with adverse childhood experiences because ACEs lead to more negative health outcomes. Yet we are not at this place where people know what, what ACEs are or what toxic stress is. Um, and so it's not changing their behavior. Um, next, we want to see this policy change where we really are pulling those policy levers um, at a systems level, at an administrative level that improve outcomes for kids. And what the real success we've seen in changing the smoking culture in um, the United States has been doing these two things and it's led to a norms change. 50 years ago, somebody smoking around your kid, you know, you might move your kid out of the way. Maybe, maybe not. Now, if somebody is smoking around your kid, you're like, get that cancer stick away from my child. You feel empowered to tell them to, to move on. So we want those, those same sorts of norms change to happen with ACEs. Um, another thing that I'll quickly say is uh, this is our graphic that is our guiding star for, again, how we do business. So we are seeking to change philosophy and approach, policies and funding, programs and services, and professional practice. And again, this slide turned out wonky, so I'm sorry. I think in the PDF version, it won't be this way. Um, but we are trying to do all of those things because those are the necessary actions for us to change the culture in our state and really any culture. Furthermore, we want to engage every single sector in this work. If you think about smoking cessation and other public health initiatives, um, they have engaged the media, they have engaged schools um, and, and other uh, you know, faith-based communities and those sorts of things. So we need to make this everybody's issue and find a place for everybody to be involved and communicate how they can be involved. I told you that we um, have expanded our definition of adverse childhood experiences to include those that are um, that were studied in the Philadelphia ACE study. So those expanded ACEs like bullying and living in foster care and racism, right? We include those in our definition, but also we have adopted this building community resilience model um, from uh, uh, George Washington University, where we are helping the public understand understand that things like poverty and discrimination are the things that lead to an increase in the ACEs that we see, you know, um, in our society. And then lastly, we've, we've adapted this from the RISE Center, where we have added these additional two layers to the ACE pyramid, where we're helping people think about generational and historical trauma, as well as social determinants of health or social conditions in local context, and how those are um, 
often the foundation for a lot of the ACEs that kids experience. Um, but primarily when we're thinking about kids of color um, or who, kids who live in poverty, that when we see um, ACEs, we're seeing complex trauma in a different way than um, maybe a middle class or upper class um, white child would experience them. And we're helping people understand again that the how and the what you need to do needs to involve all of these things, including research on uh, positive childhood experiences and intervening at all of these levels in order to make the change that we need to make and ensure that all children have the opportunity to, to really flourish. So now we're moving on to what? And I really am not reading these, okay? They are there for your reference for later. Um, but I wanna say that, you know, these are our goals and they really reflect what I just said, but they, those are the formal goals. Um, and I wanna kind of talk about a little bit about how um, uh, Building Strong Brains got started and then how we have um, envisioned the structure, the infrastructure that makes it up. So um, we were very blessed um, that, or lucky, that um, we had a first lady with the Haslam administration who began to understand ACEs and had um, one of the, the commissioner of the Department of Children's Services attend a community-wide meeting in Memphis with Dr. Felitti and Robin Carr Morse and others. Um, and he really, again, a light bulb went off and he wanted to do something at a state level and had that support of the governor and the administration. So say that to say um, that we engaged frameworks very heavily from the beginning. Again, it was, it is really the key to our success. Um, and when we engaged them, they helped us create a summit um, where they brought in all three branches of government um, to really be a part of this an entire learning day full of learning about adverse childhood experiences, early brain development, and communication science. So we had Supreme Court justices there, legislators, half of the governor's cabinet, and we were also pretty lucky that um, the, the commissioner of the Department of Children's Services, who was really leading this effort was promoted to deputy governor. So he had a lot more power and could generate a lot more political will to make this um, so successful. So from the get-go, our goal was that this didn't belong to any person because when it belongs to somebody, people think they got it, right? But this belongs to everybody and it needed to be guided by public sector, a public sector steering group, um, supported, balanced by the private sector and input there, and then supported by foundation and in-kind resources from state government. Um, again, I'm not going to read this slide, but I just want to hit these four um, visual points here that our work is really about engaging folks um, through training and messaging, equipping them with tools, um, connecting them to learnings and shared information and then supporting them to think about how they can sustain their work. And this really never ends. There's always gonna be people um, that need to learn more and the science changes. Um, so this is, when we think about our strategic priorities, this is where we often live. In terms of the infrastructure, we have this coordinating team that meets weekly, but then we also have, as I said, this public and private sector group that meet quarterly and they really oversee and drive a lot of the work. And then at the end, what you'll see is um, knowledge mobilization teams. So those are groups throughout the state that are really trying to um, it, um, embody the Building Strong Brains goals at a local level and change local context and local outcomes uh, through that systems change and, and some collective impact strategies. We have innovation grantees, which I will share um, very shortly after we got started because we had that deputy governor in the office and the political will of the governor and the first lady. We had an appropriation of $1.25 million to ACEs Innovation Grants. When he finished his second term, our governor, um, he, uh, he almost doubled it to $2.45 million and put it into recurring funds so we don't have to fight for it every year. And even though we thought we might lose the funds with COVID, um, the legislature, because of the work we've done with them, decided not to take that out of the budget, which has been pretty exciting. And then we have this massive amount of trainers that we call the Learning Collaborative. And so again, they're often operating at a local level. Um, 
it is our goal to achieve change from grassroots to grass tops so that we do truly generate culture change. And so you'll see that all of these cogs really work together where we have a lot of this statewide visioning and support. We have these, these, this public and private sector support broadly and the changes they're making and the local community support. And it really is bi-directional. So getting information from them at the local level improves our policies and procedures at the state level and investments. And then um, uh, on the other side of that, when they have the state behind them and they have resources, um, it really does uh, improve a uh, community's ability to use already developed resources um, and to have a, a lot of the will behind the work that they're trying to do in their own school system or with their own Metro Council. The Training for Trainers initiative has been one of our biggest means of it increasing knowledge in many sectors across the state. So we developed that training curriculum. It's as much as three hours, as few as um, 15 minutes, depending on who you've got as an audience, because you know certainly if you're in front of a Rotary Club, you might only have 15 minutes to give. But it is a, a curriculum that I often say we curated because we were we have just experienced such generosity of spirit from other communities, including Harvard Center on the Developing Child and the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child and Alberta Family Wellness Initiative, as well as lots of other folks who have said, yes, here's our content, right? You can use it, uh, just you know, give us credit. And, um, uh, also frameworks helped us a lot to make sure that everything was well framed so that these metaphors were used effectively and these values were used effectively and they are very sticky and repeatable by anybody who hears them. Um, another big goal of ours was we were not just going to train people who played in our specific sandbox, right? We were not just going to train folks like me that already care about this issue. We wanted to also recruit faith leaders um, uh, police chiefs, um, uh, what am I trying, uh, chief medical officers of hospitals, those kinds of folks, and teachers and counselors and case managers, everybody, and really representing all those sectors that you saw around the four P's graphic earlier, that's who we see to engage and from every community. Um, we know if we're not engaging all these folks, this, this work will not sustain and reach the momentum it needs to. To this point in the last four and a half years, um, we have reached over 80,000 people and we do have more than 1200 trainers. Um, and we know that again, that's conservative because a lot of folks, um, they, they mean well and they mean to report their numbers, but they don't. Uh, but it's been a very exciting thing. And we've of course had revisions and the like, um, but these, these well-framed um, presentations have helped bring more churches along, more schools along. And then we have more and more people knocking down the door saying, I want to be a trainer too, right? I want to spread the message because it's, you know, they're affected in the same way that we are, that once we've connected to their why, they, they're lit up and they want to share it with the world. Um, so it's been really, really exciting. Also want to point out, um, in this previous slide, you'll see that we've had presentations in almost all of our 95 counties and that we've had representation in those trainings um, by residents from all 95 counties. And uh, I also want to point out that in our um, ACES Innovation Grants, I know this is small and hard to read, so please um, just know that I can share a link to all of the ACES Innovation Grants we funded. But you can see that in FY20, um, we had real diversity in terms terms of the communities and making sure that we were equitable across the state, which sometimes means that we have to say no to really good projects in urban areas because urban areas have benefits that rural areas do not have. And we need to ensure that we are supporting folks um, across our state in every single community. So when you look at every one of the maps associated with the, the, the um, projects that were funded, you'll notice that there is this nice distribution across the state. So in my last like five minutes, 
<laughs> I'm going to just quickly say, um, how is this translated to um, infant and early childhood mental health? Well, as more people understand how early child development works and why um, the experiences and relationships in our earliest years and months of life matter for the next 80 years, it builds up this political will and this public will for investment in long um, under-resourced um, uh, areas pertaining to infants and toddlers. So we've seen an integration of a lot of infant mental health, infant and early childhood mental health practices in uh, pediatric settings, early care and education, child welfare, et cetera. Um, and I have a whole list of the ways in which that has been translated, but just want you to know that a key part of our training efforts and awareness efforts have been with our early childhood educators and um, it has now been made a requirement uh, by the Department of Human Services that um, all of their um, uh, folks that have received certification that they're, um, oh my goodness, licensed to childcare facilities that they have to receive a training on ACEs, right? They receive the Building Strong Brands training every five years. And so we have our CCRNR, our um, training, our Early Childhood Training Alliance, all of these folks that are involved in helping equip these workers to understand how important their relationships are. We have seen our um, in Association of Infant Mental Health and respective endorsement explode here in Tennessee. We've seen support from state um, departments to support infant early childhood mental health issues uh, or uh, work rather. We've seen um, the safe baby court, the zero to three model safe baby court legislation passed and funded by our legislature. We've seen two gen work increase in our Department of Human Services, and it is blowing up. And a big reason for that is because the Building Strong Brains work has led the found, uh, laid the foundation for people understanding, again, getting back to the why, why it matters to them. So this is a couple of the takeaways that you can um, read a little bit later. Um, and I forgot to stop Pamela and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, she asked me to pause at some of those natural pauses, but, um, but I was trying to get through it and I forgot. So anyway, I'm happy to take any questions um, or be available by email. Yeah, I think that um, I think that Stacy um, had a question that she put into the chat, Stacy. Um, please feel free to unmute and um, ask your question. And then Jen, do you wanna just stop sharing your screen so we yeah. can see folks for the last couple of minutes here? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if Stacy's able to come off mute, but I know that, oh, Stacy, can you ask your question, please? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. we can, thanks. <laughs> I really feel like that has been the line of our lives for, you know, the past right. year and a half, right? <laughs> so, <true. laughs> so my question is, I wanted to say this is a great presentation, um, a lot of really good information. Um, I'm calling from, well, I'm here from New Jersey, uh, and I wanted to know what role did the parent leaders play in uh, just throughout the entire process, the planning, the evaluation, the implementation, like what, what role did uh, the parent leaders play? Stacy, that's an excellent question. And I'm gonna be 100% transparent. I hope you were here for the beginning where I said, I'm highlighting some of the successes, but there are a lot of barriers. One- Yes, I was. <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so honestly, this is an area where we have not excelled. Um, we are working, like we've recently undergone a strategic plan and this has become emerged as a priority for us in our strategic plan, um, but it is not something that we've done um, well, if at all, in many respects. Now, reaching out to a lot of these communities, we do have foster parents and those kinds of folks who give us feedback um, and are involved, but not at the level you're talking about. And we have a lot of we we have we have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much for your uh, transparency and, and honesty. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that, and look forward to hearing the next presentation after you guys have worked with your parent leaders to say, okay. So this is what came out of it. I love it. This is really, I mean, this is an amazing presentation. I've had the chance to speak to Jen a lot about this work and it's really impressive. And I feel like relates 
um, so um, significantly to our systems of care work and the engagement across sectors. I actually wanted to ask you one question, Jen. Um, so in thinking about the role of sort of addressing compassion fatigue, how, how can an initiative um, such as this sort of institutionalize the idea of self-care and take it into account in, in various ways in designing these opportunities for the workforce? Absolutely. And I know that we likely have a lot of infant mental health folks on this call. And so um, I certainly think lean on your reflective supervision. If you have access to that or any supervision that any of you may have, um, this is the time to really use it and lean on um, lean on your supervisor and be honest as much as you feel that you can be honest. Um, the, you know, one thing that we know about trauma-informed care and practices or responsiveness is that you, we can't operate from a truly trauma-informed lens as an organization unless we are seeing trauma-informed practices and supports at every level. So, of course, our direct service people need that support now more than ever. Um, it's, I mean, all frontline people have had a very, very tough year. Um, but also, we need to make sure that our middle managers and our executives are also um, engaging in this self-care and engaging in um, uh, trauma-informed practices as a whole, because uh, if not, we're not gonna see that really translate in a meaningful way to the frontline <laughs> workers. Um, so a lot of self-compassion, a lot of um, boundary setting, you know, um, we know that when leaders practice self-care and don't work 50, 60 hours, that that is one of the best indicators or best, most helpful practices for their staff not to do that, right? Because then it's like, oh, okay, well, if, if my boss is taking this time, you know, if my boss is shutting off her phone, then I can feel comfortable to shut off my phone too. Um, so I, I really think it is about, um, as Brene Brown says, showing up with your whole self and really attempting to have transformation at every level in your organization and talking about um, how that really benefits the organization in terms of employee retention and productivity. A really important consideration. Thanks so much. I know we only have a minute left, unfortunately. I just want to um, be able to share some, um, so right, um, Jen works on a great team um, in Tennessee. So here is the way to get in touch with Jen and her team with any follow-up questions. I know she uh, and also mentioned that she was happy to some of them, the maps that had um, awards um, noted on it. She's happy to provide uh, a list with hyperlinks if you're curious to see what any of those implementation awards look like in the regions. I just wanted to note that we have a couple of things still coming up. Um, in, uh, that our center is offering. We have our last session on engaging uh, on, in our community practice on engaging with fathers and father figures tomorrow, which should be, should be a great session on how to um, leverage lived experience in this work, um, in this peer support work with fathers and father figures in systems of care. And then we actually do have, which I'm very excited about, we have a community of practice. We have several communities of practice um, this summer on Thursdays. So you can just think of that time as time that you can do some deeper dives. Um, we have one on, on staff wellness and self-care starting in July. And then we have one on supporting young children, families, staff, and or uh, in times of complex trauma, kind of hopefully providing some um, very of the moment resources. And Jen presented um, the BCR Building Community Resilience Model. We've actually engaged with those folks. Um, so we'll hear from the folks at GW on an equity toolkit they have that specifically addresses racial trauma. And we'll also hear from a local community mental health agency that's implementing that approach. So I'm really excited about this, um, the community of practice we have that we can dig deeper into, you know, different levels of the system that um, Jen was talking about in Tennessee's approach. And we also have one on supporting families of young children coping with with substance misuse later in the summer. Next month, we have a great webinar coming up with um, Johanna Bergman from Youth Move National um, that we're gonna discuss how we can translate some of the concepts of um, youth voice and choice to early childhood systems of care, which is really an exciting um, area. 
wanted to say thanks to everyone for logging in today on the early we're committed to being concise here at this point in the pandemic and not keeping people on zoom for so long but you can always get a hold of us uh, for additional resources details or support um, we do have a um a, a survey uh, just to see how you like this, what kinds of other topics or formats would help move your work forward. So you'll get that link with the slides that have a little bit more detail from Jen um, after the webinar. But thanks so much for logging in today. Um, and then, right, it, here's ways to get in touch with our center in case you want individual technical, technical assistance or just to learn of any of our upcoming events across teams. Um, I really appreciate it. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. And thanks so much, Jen. This was so helpful and um, in, just insightful for all of us. <laughs>